In this video tutorial, we're going to walk through what occurs in the nephrons of the kidney. Nephrons are the basic functional unit of the kidneys, which means that they are the smallest structure possible that performs the same basic functions as the kidneys themselves. In other words, when you think about what kidneys do, that is mostly what nephrons do. We are going to start with the glomerulus of a nephron, which is the capillary where blood is filtered. Glomeruli are located in the cortical layer of the kidneys. The glomerulus is a fenestrated capillary, which means that it has openings large enough to remove the majority of things from the blood, but small enough to prevent cells from leaving the blood. This is why you do not have blood cells in your urine. The glomerulus also has gateway proteins, which are negatively charged, hence why proteins are not filtered out of the blood and are therefore not in your urine. What does leave the glomerulus, however, entering the Bowman's capsule surrounding the glomerulus, includes water, glucose, sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, and other ions. Overall, the nephrons filter approximately 180 liters of this fluid per day. However, as much as 99% or 178 liters of this needs to get reabsor reabsorbed. Otherwise, we wouldn't survive. The fluid that is ultra-filtered into the Bowman's capsule goes into the proximal tubule, or the proximal convoluted tubule, of the nephron. Importantly, this ultra-filtrate is isotonic to blood, or equal concentration to blood. This is roughly 300 milliosmoles. The reason why the ultra-filtrate is the equal concentration to blood, despite everything that's been filtered out, is because equal parts water and solutes have been filtered out of the blood. Now from here on out, we are going to be talking about reabsorption and secretion throughout the nephron because much of what is in the ultrafiltrate needs to be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. It is highly important that there is so much reabsorption throughout the nephron because so much gets filtered out of the blood in the glomerulus. What drives the majority of reabsorption in the proximal tubule are the sodium potassium ATPase pumps. These pumps, which use ATP, are the primary consumer of energy in the kidneys, which, remember, use approximately 10% of the body's resting metabolic energy. First off, the sodium potassium ATPase pumps drives the reabsorption of sodium out of the ultrafiltrate and back into the blood. Roughly 65% of the sodium filtered out of the blood in the glomerulus is actually reabsorbed back into the blood here in the proximal tubule. The development of such a strong sodium gradient from ultrafiltrate to blood powers co-transporter proteins of glucose and any amino acids that may be present. As such, 100% of the glucose and amino acids that left the blood in the glomerulus is reabsorbed through the cells and back into the blood in addition to the 65% of sodium and 100% of glucose and amino acids that are reabsorbed here in the proximal tubule, approximately 50 to 65% of other ions, such as potassium, calcium, and chloride, diffuse through and in between cells, ultimately being reabsorbed back into the blood. Importantly, water follows all the solutes, diffusing through and in between the cells therefore being reabsorbed back into the blood as well. Overall, approximately 65% of all water that initially left the blood in the glomerulus is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. Following the proximal tubule, the ultrafiltrate flows into the loop of Henle, located in the medullary layer of the kidneys. Although lower in volume, the concentration of the ultrafiltrate remains isotonic to blood, again, approximately 300 milliosmoles. And again, this is because equal parts water and solutes have been reabsorbed back into the blood. Now, the overarching importance of the loop of Henle is to create the cortical medullary gradient in the surrounding interstitium, or tissue around the nephrons. This translates to the vasa recta which is the capillary surrounding the loop of Henle. In other words, 
the corticomedullary gradient in the interstitium is the same as the gradient within the vasa recta. Now this gradient is built primarily through the active transport of ions in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle and the diffusion of water in the descending limb of the loop of Henle. Now for simplicity's sake, I'm going to show the active transport of the primary ion involved in this corticomedullary gradient, which is sodium. There are, however, other solutes that contribute to the gradient as well. So as a reminder, the ultrafiltrate enters the loop of Henle as isotonic to blood, or approximately 300 milliosmoles. And this is very important because in the loop of Henle, the ultrafiltrate will change to hypertonic, approximately 1200 milliosmoles, so significantly more concentrated, and then to the other end of the spectrum to hypotonic, which is approximately 100 milliosmoles. Because of the active transport of ions, such as sodium, in the ascending limb and the diffusion of water in the descending limb of the loop of Henle, a gradient is developed, the corticomedullary gradient. This means that as the 300 milliosmol ultrafiltrate descends deeper into the medullary layer from the proximal tubule, more concentrated interstitium is encountered. This means that at 300 milliosmoles, the ultrafiltrate will encounter 400 milliosmol interstitium. And as a result, water will diffuse out of the ultrafiltrate into the interstitium, which is more concentrated, and into the blood of the vasa recta, which is again more concentrated. As such, the ultrafiltrate at that level becomes equally concentrated as the interstitium and as the vasa recta at that level again, approximately 400 milliosmoles. This is because water left and entered the blood. This process repeats as the ultrafiltrate flows deeper and deeper, ultimately becoming approximately 1,200 milliosmoles, or hypertonic, when it reaches the bottom of the descending limb. This means that the ultrafiltrate is hypertonic to blood, and this is due to the significant amounts of water that has been reabsorbed while the solutes remain in the ultrafiltrate. As the hypertonic ultrafiltrate enters and ascends the loop of Henle, less concentrated interstitium is encountered. As the ultrafiltrate flows upwards, ions such as sodium are actively pumped out and into the surrounding medullary interstitium and eventually back into the vasa recta. This is going to take away the concentration of that ultrafiltrate, such that by the time the ultrafiltrate reaches the top of the loop of Henle, the ultrafiltrate is hypotonic, or significantly less concentrated than blood, and significantly less concentrated than at any other point in the nephron prior to this point. It is approximately 100 milliosmoles. Ultimately, by the time the ultrafiltrate leaves the loop of Henle, approximately 15% more water and 25 to 30% more sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium ions have been reabsorbed back into the blood. This equates to an ultrafiltrate that is further lower in volume and significantly less concentrated than before. Roughly, 80% of all water and 80 to 90% of all ions filtered out of the blood in the glomerulus have been reabsorbed back into the blood at this point. Ultrafiltrate, which is now going to be called pre-urine, enters the distal tubule of the nephron next. The distal tubules are in the cortical layer of the kidneys, and the ultrafiltrate is hypotonic to blood, with 20% of water and 10 to 20% of ions remaining. What occurs here in the distal tubule, and in the collecting duct for that matter, is dependent on the body's needs and what the hypothalamic and renal receptors detect in the blood. If necessary, further reabsorption of sodium and chloride will, will be performed through sodium chloride symporter proteins and sodium potassium pumps. Sodium is reabsorbed and potassium is secreted through these pumps. 
if necessary, further reabsorption of potassium will, will occur through hydrogen potassium pumps, in which potassium is reabsorbed and hydrogen is secreted. This is also actually used to lower the blood's pH by eliminating excess hydrogen ions. Parathyroid hormone stimulates the reabsorption of calcium if blood levels are too low. If blood volume and blood pressure is too low, then more water can be reabsorbed in the collecting duct as well. The primary determinant of if more water is reabsorbed in the collecting duct will be through the presence or absence of antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. If ADH is released by the pituitary gland and present, then water channel proteins called aquaporins will be present in the collecting duct. As the preurine descends through the collecting duct deeper and deeper into the renal medulla, the fluid, preurine, will encounter more and more concentrated interstitium. Now remember, the cortical medullary gradient was built by the loop of Henle. So depending on the body's needs, up to 19.9% of the remaining 20% of water remaining in the preurine can be re reabsorbed. So if you are dehydrated, then closer to 19.9% will be reabsorbed. If you are overhydrated, in other words, on the other end of the spectrum, then closer to 0% will be reabsorbed. Overall, you can think of the distal tubule and collecting duct of a nephron as the final customizer of urine. Your urine here can be made as concentrated or dilute as instructed by the hypothalamus and the kidneys. In this video tutorial, we walk through what occurs in the nephrons of a kidney, the basic functional units. Of the kidneys. Any further questions or point of clarification should be directed to Dr. Pollock during office hours or by appointment.